<clears throat> All right. We're in. We're still in Ezekiel chapter ten, and um, I tell you, this is an interesting book. It's kind of hard to. Well, it is. It is hard to to manage in in all the different uh, symbolism that's in it and um, interpret all of that correctly. So I pray that the Lord would give us guidance through that. But uh, I want to I want to touch on something that was said in our last time we met over Ezekiel chapter 10. And that was that the Lord seemed to, in the Old Testament, show up in some sort of physical manifestation that allowed them to know that they were following God. Like, for instance, the tabernacle, when it was in the the, the uh, uh, wilderness when they were traveling through the wilderness they had the portable tabernacle they had the Ark of the Covenant in it which was the many uh, miracles in the hands that God had uh, or things he had done with his hand and you uh, could camp up maybe on a high point you could see the smoke coming up out of the, the temple and that's to let you know that God's presence was there that was a physical thing that you could see when they were being led through the wilderness um, right after their exit from Egypt they were led by a small cloud by day and a fire by night when they had to travel by night so there's another physical presence of God and you've seen this throughout and those are just some just some ones that you would recognize but throughout the Old Testament you see where men had visions that uh, displayed these things that are just really supernatural and hard to maybe put into words and try to describe exactly. And, that, and what Ezekiel saw and throughout his, I would say, his tenure as a prophet, and he spoke to people about what God was showing him and tried to explain it to them. I'm, I'm sure that they were amazed as well and maybe couldn't grasp all of it as, as, uh, as well as we can because we have the complete word and we have, when I say complete, we have all the inspired word that God has for us today through the Old Testament, New Testament. There had to be some sort of dispensation change from the Old Testament to New Testament because if you look back in the Old Testament, God was always in a physical form, like I said before, helping and intervening in people's lives. He, you know the various stories. He spoke through donkeys. He did things that were just just out of, the, out of your, I mean, you just can't fathom them. They're, they're hard to figure out sometimes. And then you got the New Testament where Jesus fulfilled the coming of to Calvary as the ultimate sacrifice for all of us. In the Old Testament, you had the tabernacle. You, you had lots of animals that were uh, put to death and their blood poured out on the altar for your forgiveness, for your sins to be forgiven. Kind of an old uh, dispensation, old law. And I won't say that, it, I shouldn't say old law. It's still a law that's being fulfilled today because God, Jesus said he didn't come to do away with it. He come to fulfill it. However, he ultimately fulfilled it. Matter of fact, I know that when um, Jan was sharing with me of one of person that she met today in the grocery line or whatever, young lady had on her arm, it is finished, and relating to what Christ had done on Calvary. So when we look at that uh, for a minute, that, that idea when Jesus said it is finished, the sacrifice was finished. He was it. And so man don't kill animals no more. Now, if you're Orthodox Jew, if you're still, uh, Jesus is not your Messiah, and you're still going by Old Testament like they are, many of them are in Israel doing, they'll go back to the temple uh, sacrifices so they can go back to that. But Jesus had fulfilled 
Um, so I don't, I don't know how that's all going to work, work out. Um, maybe you got to be, uh, what is it, a pantheist to see how it pans out? I don't know. I just don't know how that's going to work out because Jesus was the, was the final and complete sacrifice for our sin. And so having said all that, when we, got in the, when we look at the New Testament forward, look at what Christ done, he said something that was amazing. And we still today, I think we say it a lot, but we don't think about it much. And you got to take this in. He says, I'm going to send you another. And what did he say? He's what? I'm going to send you another. What is he? Holy Spirit. Just like me. And I'm going to put him this time in your heart. Won't be on the written word. Won't be on tablets. He'll be in your heart. And this, who I'm sending you, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, he will lead you. Where, now, so, so we need to think about this a minute. Every day that you have, and I said this a while ago, every purpose in life, that every door that's opened or every person you enter, uh, you maybe come to meet in a day's time. You may think it's just happenstance sometimes, and we do that. We just go about our busy lives and we think, oh, this is you know, hey, I got a chance to witness today. You don't realize who's leading you. You don't realize who's directing your steps and who's ordaining their steps so that you and them can have a spiritual moment where God can intervene, God can use you as a mouthpiece, just like he did Ezekiel. Now, you're not a prophet, but you're you are proclaiming. You're proclaiming God's word. So you, um, in ways, you're proclaiming liberty to the captive. That's what you're doing, right? Now Jesus come to do just that. So said all that to say this. The spirit of God in Ezekiel's time here was omnipresent and omnipotent. And that means that God saw all, knew all, and was still leading. And what God has did with you through the Holy Spirit, and I got to be careful here, but you have the presence of God with you. Do you believe that? Yes. If you believe that today, now, how does that change a day? Now, you don't leave God at home when you got up this morning and you brushed your teeth. God didn't stay in bed. He's right there with you and he goes with you. And you may, in a day's time, you may not have a, a conversation with God. You should. You always, your day should start with a conversation to God. He gave you life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for waking me up this morning. But you ought to have a conversation with God, and you ought to realize who is in you because His presence is in you. So let's see how this would change life. So I'm sitting on the couch. I'm reclining in the recliner, and I'm watching TV. Now here goes, guys, gals. I'll put it in terms you can understand. God says in his word, set no evil thing in front of your eyes. Well, you just not messed up right away because you got TV on. <laughs> then you get a commercial about lingerie. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, you may turn your eyes or you may turn the channel. But you got to think a minute. Who was with you? did I drag God into this? Because look, sometimes that's exactly what the, the Christian will do. They'll, they'll just forget about the presence of God being with them and they'll move their own direction and they'll move away from God. And they'll, I don't mean to use the term drag, 
because God, you don't drag God nowhere, but you do involve yourself in something that here to Ezekiel, we had read where Ezekiel, we read the presence of God left the temple. Why did the presence of God leave the temple? Because it, it was being, it was being, what's the word? Somebody help me out. It was being desecrated. It was being, it was being, uh, they were putting things in the temple that wasn't supposed to be in the temple, that wasn't godly at all. They were, they even changed some of the paintings and drawings in the temple away from the cherubs, away from the angels, away from God's particular description he gave and maybe did something else. And so they're making a mockery of his temple and he's leaving. Now this is Old Testament. Now today we got New Testament, we got a different dispensation. Jesus is in you. Jesus promises he'll never leave you nor forsake you, but he does tell you this. In East Texas terms, I will chastise you. Hebrews teaches that. You know that you're God's child because of that chastisement. Now, I don't, I'm, I'm not preaching to you today that, that if you go out and sin, you lose your salvation. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying here today is that you hurt the heart of God when you do that and the fellowship that you have with Him. And then... Um, we read on this vision about these wheels that turn within a wheel. These directions of these things were not uh, hindered whatsoever. There is a order and there is a direction and there is a leadership of God that, that he, you cannot change. He will lead where he wants to go. Now the question is, are you going to follow him? That's the big question. Because see, I believe he leads down the road of righteousness. That's what he does in your life. He's leading you down the road of righteousness. Can you get a hold of that for a minute? He's ch forever changing you. He's working through your life. He's putting in the word of God. He's, he's, now you are saved and he's washing you. He's cleansing you. And everything that happens in your life happens for a reason. I'll give you one here. Romans 8, 28. All of you ought to know it. What does it say? Somebody want to tell me what it says. All right. We know, and we know, who's we? God's people. And we know that all things work together there it is. Together, all things work together for the good to those who love God. Do you love God tonight? So all things work together for those who love God. And God, that love God, to who are the called, called is lead, is, he's directing you. He's, he's, he's changing your direction in his way. He's leading you. Called according to his purpose. And what's his purpose? You heard some of it in prayer time. What's his purpose? For you to reach people. For you to be a, te a witness. For you to be a testimony to those around you. For you to leave a life down the righteous road. Now, I shouldn't say that very much because you might think that I'm preaching legalism to you. I'm not. When I got saved, God says, you turn from that. Though you died in the, to self. Look, you're a new creation. And a new creation is going a new path. And that new path is following God. So here's what happened to Israel. They got away from God. Very simple. That's what they did. They got away from God. They started bringing things into God's temple that they shouldn't have done. And the Spirit of God says, I don't have no part in this. So we're going to read where he left the threshold. And I think, in, uh, let me get over to where I need to start here. I kind of got hung up on that for a minute. In chapter, in verse 9 of chapter 10. And when I looked, there were four wheels by the cherub and one wheel 
by one cherub and another wheel by each cherub. And the wheels appeared to have a color of beryl stone as for their appearance all four looked alike as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went forward. Uh, I'm sorry. They, when they went, they went toward any of their four directions. They did not turn aside when they went, but followed in the direction the head was facing. They were being obedient to the, call, to the direction God on the thrones called them to go. They did not turn aside when they went. And their whole body and their, their back and their hands and their wings and the wheels of the four had were full of eyes all around, all knowing. As for the wheels, they were called in my hearing wheel. You go, now what in the world is all this saying? There's order to God's direction. There's constant activity, constant motion. When you got up this morning, you thought this was your day. You thought the day was created for you. Come on now, let's just be honest with one another. Let's have a Robert day. Well, it doesn't work like that. When you're called according to God's purpose... When he got you up this morning, he put direction to you. He ordered your steps. Now, I pray that, and you pray also, when God, when you order my steps, let them be pleasing. In other words, let me follow. Let me know. Let me fulfill. Let me do what you called me to do in a day's time. Whatever that day might be, it may be saying, do you know what it is finished really means? It may just be that simple of a day. That's it. That's all God wants you to do that day, but he wants you to do that. God may not ask you, he may not put a lot on your agenda in one day, but what he does put on your agenda, you need to do. If it's one little small thing or many things, he directs your steps, so think about that. Um, so the whole body, it said there, their, their back, their neck, their hands, their wings, and the wheels were eyes all around them. Um, cherubs themselves, and, and, I, and I, we're getting into something now that I'm not an authority on. And I'm going to tell you, you can read and study all you want. This is going to get way past you really quick. But we have these these cherubs, these angels, these wings and, and eyes and their wings on both sides. And we know that throne of God that we have these creatures flying around saying, holy, 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 constantly. Now, we say they're singing holy, 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 but the Bible doesn't say they're singing. It just says they're saying holy, holy, holy. And uh, so anyway... But, you know, there again, you take God and you, you take God the Father for a moment. All that he's doing, he's doing through the, through the Holy Spirit. That's what he's doing. It's that connection in you. Think about this for a minute. I, I know this sounds kind of crazy to you, but Jesus died for me. And he saved me. And he's at the right hand of the Father right now. This is what the Bible says. These are facts I'm giving you now. He's at the right hand of the Father. And what's he doing for me? Oh, well, I saved him. He's okay. He's good. Turn him loose. Let him go. Okay, I'll rapture him up when the time comes. No, he's interceding for me. He's praying for me. He's, he's instructing the Holy Spirit in many ways. This is what I want to achieve in his life. And the Holy Spirit and the Son and the Father are all one. You got to get your head wrapped around that for a moment, but at the same time, that's what He's doing. I'm going to send you another one just like me. 
right? What did he do with the disciples? Now, when he was around them, teaching them, you know, they had, they had uh, unbelief issues sometimes. I'll say it like that. And then what did he say? How long must I be with you? Didn't you see what I going on here? Did you know that I am God? And he even had to ask that question before to him. Who do you say I am? Because if you don't believe today, if you don't believe you have Almighty God, the Holy Spirit living within you, then God could possibly say, where is your faith? The glory of God departed that temple and that threshold and he left. And I would never want, and I believe possibly this is where David may have got the idea, take not your Holy Spirit from me. I don't want that to ever happen. And, and, I, and I tell you, I see so many scriptures that say God will never leave you nor forsake you. I see scriptures that talk about once you're saved, you're saved. Well, if you confess, now I believe in genuine salvation. What I mean by that is a man will change. If a man don't change, it wasn't genuine. He had an experience, not a conversion. But if he had, a, if he had the real deal and he's changing and God's working on his heart, He's the potter, I'm the clay, and he works on you. And he, he forms you and shapes you and makes you into that person in Christ that you should be. And it's down the righteous road all day long. You may say, no, God don't carry me down the righteous. Yes, he does. He leads you in a way that is right. If you break down the word righteousness and come down to one word, which is right, this is where God will lead you. Um, well, he's just getting me ready for heaven. He got me ready for heaven in 1977. Hey, that rhymes. He got me ready for heaven in 1977. However, he's making me and shaping me and molding me and leading me. And I'll tell you what, I think a lot of it has to do with, I think our, I'm just going to throw it out there, our success with God. What do you mean our success? Y'all ever have any blessings? Y'all ever get any blessings from God? Why does God bless you? Come on, tell me why God blesses you. You know how, uh, you, ain't, you ain't bringing nothing to the table here. So what is, why is God blessing you? And married in favor. That's exactly right. And you know what? He's faithful and blessing you. And, and you know what he's, he's going to do when he uses you? And he does use you. Does everybody believe that? Amen. Okay. If you believe he uses you today, he has a particular path for you to walk today, and you're fulfilling that path, and you're doing what God's called you to do, then God's going to bless you, right? I'm so thankful that I talked to those people I'm so thankful those people come in the church. I'm so thankful that God had me carry them out to lunch. And then I'm so thankful that we had a conversation about God and we realized we would have been having these experiences all this time in, in, in the Christian church. But they were looking for conversion. And I'm thankful that God took the scriptures and opened their eyes. And then God says, okay, I want, you to, I want you to lead them to me through the scriptures. And we led them to Christ. Nothing we did. Folks, we were just a tool in God's hands. That's all we were. But you know what? We reaped a blessing when we were finished. What blessing did we reap? Soul winners, crown, you, go, you talk about that. kind. We're reaping blessings in God. Why? I was talking to Deborah the other night, was talking about mega churches who, that it seems like all churches should be big churches. I'm, I'm good with whatever God does as long as we got a big spirit within us. In other words, we are full of 
God's spirit and walking with him. However, when you get that, you get people that are in the, king, in the world being a witness for Christ when you get that. You get people that are out there doing those sort of things and so the church grows. Take, take Peter, for instance. I was telling Deborah about this. What about old Peter? He gets up there. He preaches on the steps that I stood on at the, at the um, uh, help me out, Deborah. The temple, the temple mount. It wasn't a temple mount, was it Capernaum? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Different location. But I'm standing there anyway. And here's where Peter tells a, a world that has, uh, tells a bunch of people about this Jesus. They have been doing all these miracles. Of course, we're, we're talking past the death and the resurrection. And we're talking about the 50 days had passed and Here's, here's Peter preaching. And what happened? 3,000 people get saved. Mega church right there. <laughs> well, we got to bring in a mega preacher. Got to bring in the, for this mega crowd a mega preacher. What was Peter? Fisherman. A fisherman. And think about the things that Jesus said. When he told Peter, he said, Peter, I'm going to make you a fisher of what? Men. Men. He caught 3,000 that day. He did pretty good, right? But God's anointing, God's word, God's power changes all those people. What about if Peter hadn't have done what God called him to do that day? He'd have missed a big blessing. Probably somebody else would have stepped up. Probably not Thomas right yet, but, you know, somebody else would have stepped up. So God has direction for you. And when I see this vision that he has, let me jump to 20 and 20, 20 and verse 22 down at the end of the chapter. This is the living creature I saw under God of Israel by the river, river Sebar, and knew that they were a cherubim. Each one had four wings, and each one, uh, four, each, I'm sorry, each one had four faces, each one had four wings, and the likeness of the hands of the man under the wings. Now get this. And the likeness of their faces was like the same as the faces I have seen at the river Seabar. Their appearance and their persons they each went straight forward. Now, I missed a scripture. Let me back up. I missed it somewhere. These things had, uh, well, maybe I didn't, but I thought I did. Uh, they each had different heads, and I did miss it. One of their four faces, one face and it was a face of a cherub, the second face, a face of a man, the third, the face of a lion, and, and then the fourth, the face of an eagle. And so if you want to wrap your head around that, uh, some, <laughs> some explain this by saying that these beings, these angels or these creatures with, with different faces and, and all of it symbolic representing different things that that God wants them to represent. But they're escorting basically, and well, I wouldn't, shouldn't say it like that. God's removing himself from the temple. And they're, they're with him. They're going. Um, and all I can tell you here, I, I looked at this and, and you could... Nobody wants to touch this. Nobody wants to touch. Well, why the face of an eagle? Why the face of an ox? It, it, that word cherubim, that face of cherubim, translates into the face of an ox. Well, why the face of an ox? Why the face of a man? Why the face of an eagle? It all has some symbolism of some sort. But many writers and many scholars and many people don't want to even tackle that. Because that's, God's design. 
Uh, I don't know what to tell you today, but to tell you this, that vision where he sees these and he sees the throne of God, he sees the cherubim, the wheels in a wheel, uh, all of this is all symbolic to the fact that God's glory has left the temple. Left it. That's why Ezekiel saw it over in Babylon. Why am I seeing this over in Babylon? Isn't the glory of God supposed to be in the temple in Jerusalem? Now, if we want to look at this here today and just try to sum it up best way we can, here's what I'm going to tell you. New Testament-wise, when I received the Holy Spirit, I, I, am, I, got the, I got a heart just like David would have said, Oh, Lord Jesus, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Right? Once you've experienced God, and once God has changed you and headed you down the path of life, you don't want God ever leaving you, do you? This was Old Testament. New Testament, there's a different, there's a little bit of different dispensation in all that. Well, quite a bit in some ways. However, I need to tell you one thing today. God has order to life. You look at those wheels and you think a wheel and a wheel, that's, and turn in different directions, that don't seem like it has order, but it has perfect order. You know why? Because that's God's design. Look at the universe. We've been talking about the universe. Look at the eclipse. Look at all the planets flying around the sun. Look at planet Earth. You're going 66,000 miles an hour right now. Do you feel it? You're spinning a certain way. You're tilted a certain way. If you wasn't tilted a certain way, you'd freeze to death. If you wasn't spinning a certain speed, you wouldn't have gravity. You'd be flying off of here. God's design. Put all them stars out there, millions of them, and told them all, you just hang right there until I give you, until I tell you different. God's design. Now we talked about Genesis. I'll just give you this. I'll throw this out there. I was talking to Catherine earlier. Her son writes these, uh, I guess they're, what are they? They're oh, hope for today the articles. And I was reading one and, and, and he, she sent me one today. I guess he just recently wrote. And it was really good. It was talking about God created this. God created this. One just didn't happen. It ain't a fairy tale. They were talking in his article. He was talking about how some think that all the things that God did are fairy tales. It's all just myths and fairy tales. Not that. I mean, you go. How did God divide the Red Sea? I don't know. But a power, He did it. How did God take a little cloud and lead millions of people across the desert? You'd had to have been there. How did God save me? Because that one in itself. You look at it and you find the unmerited favor of God there. That he loves his creation. Do what? That's true. We do do that. Okay, so let me, let me kind of get your thought here a little bit on uh, God's leading because that's the main thing going to take place here. God's taking his spirit. He's leaving the temple. He's leading these cherubs, if you want to, uh, whatever they are. He's leading them. The wheels are going in the direction God wants them to go. And here we are on the, on the backside of this whole story where we decide in the morning which way we're going. And if we belong to God, we should give that to Him. Am I right? We should give Him our thoughts, our, I mean, give Him our whole life. And when I say that, thoughts, even sometimes we get so wrapped up in us and we forget God in some ways. 
That's right. And the new direction of change. Yeah. Really yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you ever tried to do something on your own and it just didn't work out and God somehow or another at the end of the day you realized that God intervened and kept you from doing what you was going to do that day so he could get you over here to do what you needed to do that day? Have that ever happened to you? Yeah. Well, I'll, I got a quick challenge for you. Get up one day and say, I'm going to do exactly what I want to do today. <laughs> Try that out. And see what happens during the course of the day. Just kind of pay attention to it. Now, I don't believe in happenstance anymore. I don't believe in, there are no such things, good luck, bad luck to me. I think everything God has already designed out. And already will. He's already got his direction. So all you got to do is follow it. And I'm going to tell you, on your journey down the road of righteousness, you're going to have your stops. Oh, so-and-so over there needs to be talked to. I need to, it's all about people and God. Let's just, let's just boil it down here tonight. When you get to heaven, you will not be judged for the things that you built here on earth. Come on. You'll be judged for the kingdom, what you've done in the kingdom as the, 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 the judgment seat of Christ. And what matters to God is that your relationship with Him is top. Amen. I mean, it's way up there and it is, it is flourishing and He is on top of your life, and He is first place in your life. That matters to God. And then second is going to be all of His people, the brethren, the sistren, <laughs> in Christ. And after that, you know what's going to matter? Is the people that are lost. Now, I just stacked them for you because I do believe God has a purpose in our life to follow Him, take care of the brethren, pray for them, love them, and witness to the lost. If we can do those three things and do them well, we're going to see the hand of God move powerfully in our life. If we fail on any of those, it usually starts at the top. Our relationship with God, if it gets weakened because of us dabbling with the world, and it will, then it trickles down to the others. So let's keep that one intact. Okay, let me close and say, you got any thoughts of your own? If you do, I'll let you teach Ezekiel chapter 10 to me. But I'm going to tell you, it's a, it's a challenging book. But anyway, any thoughts about the leading of God's Spirit tonight? Any thoughts about that? Are you all good with the Lord? Are you all walking with Him good? Are you, are you stayed... In a way, your mind stayed upon him. Your heart stayed upon him. Your eyes focused on him. Because that's what matters. And I, I, think, I, could, I think I could live three lifetimes down here. It wouldn't be enough. So I only got a little bit of time. So I got to get this right, right? <laughs> we got to get this right. Got a little bit of time. So please, be mindful in the morning when you wake up. Lord, this is your day. It's a beautiful day. It's, a, it's not like any other. I'm going to give it to you, Lord. Now set my feet on your path today. And submit to him. He'll bring those open doors. He'll bring where he, you're supposed to go. Life is good. And uh, remember this. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for the good. It'll keep you on the straight and narrow. Father, thank you for what you're doing, Lord. I thank you for the church. Thank you for these that are here. And Father, I pray, Lord, that is a challenging, challenging scripture to interpret with what's going on there. And Father, I pray that, Lord, that we can just take away one thing from that tonight, and that is that you lead and guide our life. And so, Lord, I need to follow you each day. And so, Lord, as this day continues on, let me continue my journey with you in this moment. 
Father, let me not turn to the right or to the left, but keep my eyes fixed upon you. Let me not be distracted by the world around me for the purpose that you put in my heart, Lord, for what you want me to achieve in the kingdom of God. Let me not get distracted, but let me follow you. And so, Lord, I thank you and I praise you for all these that are here tonight. I pray, Lord, that your house will be filled on Sunday morning. I pray, Lord, if there's someone that we need to be inviting or someone that we need to be telling about Jesus or someone that just needs an encouraging word, that, Lord Jesus, that you'll do just that in our life. With a world that's turning away from you today, Lord, with statistics that I hear that they, they did among Christians that only 37% of Christians pray and read their word. I pray, I pray God, I read your word. I pray, Lord, that that would change. Lord, I pray that the kingdom would flourish. So, Lord, help us. Father, go with us, lead us, guide us, empower us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.